The 1968 Formula 1 season had one of the darkest days in the sport's history as a driver some would say was the best all-round driver of all time got killed at a Formula 2 race in Hockenheim. That man was Jim Clark, a farmer from Scotland who had already won two Formula 1 World Championships and an Indianapolis 500. And if not for his fragile lotuses that broke down more often than they finished, he might have been challenging Fanjo for five world titles either at the point he was killed or in the years after. Now in those days it wasn't uncommon for drivers to compete in other disciplines throughout the season. At this time the season was about 12 races long, so roughly half the distance it is today. And between the South African Grand Prix of 1968 and the Spanish Grand Prix of 1968, there was a four month break. So drivers would compete in the Tasman series, which was a series down in Australia and New Zealand that was basically Formula 1 cars with smaller 2.5 litre engines. Or larger 2.5 litre engines, depending on when the series was. Clark won the series in 1968, and he'd won it twice before that as well. And even though it was non-championship, it was an opportunity for some racing, and it attracted some big names of the time. Guys such as Jim Clark, Jackie Stewart, Jack Brabham, and Denny Hulm, as well as... Chris Amon and the guys that were from the Southern Hemisphere. And even with the advent of jet-powered airliners such as the 707, it still took an age to get to Australia, and the Formula 1 World Championship didn't go to Australia yet, so at that time it was the closest that Aussie and Kiwi race fans got to Formula 1 racing, and they raced at places like Sandown and Surfers Paradise. And it was actually in the 1968 Tasman series that Lotus debuted their gold leaf tobacco liveries. And there was Formula 2, which was also a way of scratching the itch in between Grand Prix. Clark was actually due to appear at the BOAC 1000km sports car race at Brands Hatch on the weekend of 7th of April, but due to contractual obligations with Lotus' tyre supplier Firestone, he was on his way to the Hockenheim ring, which was in what was called West Germany. And just for reference, BOAC was the British Overseas Aircraft Corporation, kind of the precursor to, to British Airways. It was considered a minor event, but there were a lot of drivers on the grid whose names you might recognise. Drivers such as Jean-Pierre Beltoise, Henry Pascarolo, Clay Regazzoni, Derek Bell, Piers Courage, Chris Amon, and the recently departed ex-FIA president, Max Mosley. And because it was such a small event, Lotus only took four people to the race. And whether Chapman was there too, I can't work out, but I assume he wasn't because there's gaps in the story as people retell it. It also needs to be said that this version of Hockenheim isn't like the Hockenheim you see the cars racing around today. Some would call it the original Hockenheim or the real Hockenheim, but this is the real Hockenheim. It used to be 12 kilometers long, ran into the town of Hockenheim and ran the reverse direction to what we see today. No, this shortened half distance neutered bollocks they started running in 1966. Bring it back. Clark wasn't particularly happy this weekend. He was a quiet person anyway, but his mechanic, Dave Beaky Sims, had noticed that he was quieter than usual. He was complaining about grip, handling, and Beaky also mentioned that Graham wasn't particularly happy either. It must have been the weather making them miserable. It had been raining, and the rain at that track tended to linger around in the trees. When you add in that Clark's car had a misfire problem, it was just adding to the misery. Lotus had hoped for a dry race, but the race started in poor visibility and on a wet track, and Clark could only manage fifth with the setup and engine issues he'd been having. Seven laps later, where's Jimmy? And in an interview with Marshall Pruitt on the 50th anniversary of Clark's death, Beaky detailed what happened. A course car came round and a track marshal said in broken English, Jim Clark, mechanic? I said, what's the problem? Crash. Car crash. When we got there, I saw an ambulance, and then I was going, being young, is he okay? Can't say. Then I saw the car. Nothing left. No gearbox, and no engine. Well, where is it? Where's the engine and gearbox? In the woods. It sighed through the woods after he hit the tree, and then the shock took in. I asked to see him. Nine. In the middle of this, Graham Hill was still going round, and Peaky asked the marshal to call the pits and get Michael Gregory, who was Hill's mechanic that day, to tell Graham to come in immediately. Hill arrived in the pits, got briefed on what had happened, and said, Right, get the truck here, and get it loaded. And then Hill had to go to the medical centre and identify Clark's body. They got the car back to their hotel, but the police had arrived and explained to them that they couldn't leave Germany, as a similar law was in place to what was in Italy, and probably still is in Italy. This had to be treated as a murder scene. 
Chapman arrived at the hotel about 1 in the morning. Now, if he was there, where was he? So this is why I'm assuming that he wasn't there and that he'd driven from London or Norfolk or wherever he was to Hockenheim. I mean, I say he drove there, but he was a qualified pilot, so I'm assuming he flew on his little plane. When Chapman arrived, he was quite angry, and Beaky said, look, it's just a crash. So Chapman demanded that they get the van with the remains of Clark's car in out of West Germany immediately. But we can't, said Beaky. The police are here. I don't care, Chapman replied. So instead of taking the normal route to England, they drove off the autobahns into Belgium. When they reached the border, they found nobody at customs, so they just opened the barrier and drove on in. This is all pre-European Union and pre-freedom of movement. They then drove through Malmody and passed the Spa circuit and continued north to Zeebrugge, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, and were recognised by one of the port workers who basically said, let me have a look at the car or you don't get on the boat. Said as a fan rather than a customs officer. They showed him the car that was covered in a canvas in the back, and once they got to England they were escorted back to base because word had got out. This was quick, even by pre-internet standards. The engine went back to Cosworth. Nothing was wrong with it. The gearbox went back to Hewland. Nothing was wrong with it. The car itself went to Farnborough where it was picked apart by air crash investigators, and while the tyres went back to Firestone, it was determined that a deflation was the cause of the crash. But some still dispute it. Stuart, Dan Gurney, John Surtees and Jack Brabham were of the opinion that something had gone wrong with the car, whether it was suspension failure or a puncture, because they didn't believe that Clark was capable of making a mistake like that, because he'd effectively crashed in a straight line. But some reckon that on this one occasion Clark had made a fatal error, whether it was correcting a slide or something else, I mean it is possible. Even Senna and Schumacher had wobblies. And as a whole this had an effect across European racing. The drivers in Formula 1 and other series of that time had the belief of, it always happens to somebody else. Now they were thinking, I'm somebody else is somebody else, and if Jim Clark can be killed, I can as well. Beaky, meanwhile, was hounded by the British tabloids, who were just awful, awful people. and They accused him of leaving a bolt loose through negligence, and that killed Britain's greatest racing driver ever. Would that title still apply now in 2021? I'm going to say yes. But Beaky was absolved off blame by Cosworth, Hewland, Firestone, the other Lotus mechanics, Graham Hill, and Colin Chapman. He was actually at the next race at Harama in Spain working on Hill's car, and Hill would later win the championship that year. Clark's gravestone lists him as a farmer before being a two-time Formula 1 champion and Indy 500 winner, and there is a permanent memorial at the crash site in Hockenheim. When Herman Tilke redesigned the track for the 2002 season, he initially wanted there to be a section of track of some description at the crash site, so it could be a proper Clark corner and have a proper memorial put in. But the land where the crash happened had been sold and was therefore not able to be utilised, so the track took on the form that we see today. Clark is a name thrown into the hat whenever the topic of greatest racing driver comes up. Schumacher and Hamilton have the stats. Fangio was the pioneer, Senna had that mythical legend that he was just so bloody quick, but when he died, Clark was a two-time Formula 1 champion and had the then record 25 wins, which was then beaten by his good friend Jackie Stewart. In 1963 and 1965, he took 100% of the available points on offer thanks to the drop score rule, effectively winning every single race. And in 1963, he led over 70% of the laps, and he also holds the record for the most Grand Slams, with eight. Makes you wonder how those stats would have increased as time went on. How would he have fared with downforce coming in over the next few years? It's interesting stuff. He also won the 1964 British Touring Car Championships and had wins in rally cars, sports cars, indie cars, and generally adapted to anything he drove. It's also said that he was so easy on his equipment that brake pads could last three races. Tires could go longer still. And it's also said that if you took all of the driver's gearboxes and lined them up, mechanics would be able to tell exactly which one came out of Clark's Lotus, because it had less wear on it compared to everybody else. Even though this isn't an opinion piece, let me know what you think of Jim Clark down in the comments, and whether you think it was car failure or driver error that led to his accident. So this has been the story of the death of arguably the greatest all-round driver ever, 
Jim Clark. If you have learned something here today, then give the video a like. If you're not already, subscribe and get that bell on so you never miss out on a future video. Massive thanks as ever go out to the good folk of Patreon. If you do want to leave me a monthly tip, you can do so by following the link in the description, where there'll also be a link to Discord and also directions to my various socials. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud. Have a great day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for the videos. Until then, goodbye.